Our sermon text for this week is the uh, reading from 2 Corinthians, our epistle reading. And it's Paul writing, and this is what he says. He says, I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except of my weakness. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me, or hears from me. So to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with, my weak with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Lifelines is ending this week, this sermon series that we've been in for a while. Uh, for about the last five weeks or so, we've been talking about, about lifelines, about things that sustain our life that God gives and the, the gifts of God that serve as lifelines to us. And in some ways, this is really a great reading to wrap up the series because it deals with, uh, with kind of chronic suffering, with the sort of stuff that nags Paul throughout his life, and, and it gets us... When he, as he talks about the suffering, he gets us to his ultimate lifeline, which is the grace of God. But if you notice, the reading doesn't start off that way. It doesn't start off with, uh, with suffering. It doesn't start off with weakness. It doesn't start off with that stuff at all. In fact, uh, it starts off quite the opposite. Paul talks about uh, this, this he's boasting, really. He says, uh, I, I know a man who was caught up to the third heaven. Uh, so th that's just, I mean, third heaven is what we would think of normally as heaven. Uh, clouds were the first heaven, stars were the second, and then heaven, as we think of it, was the third heaven. Paradise, Paul also call, calls it. And he starts off with this interesting, like, kind of revelation vision that he has. But he says it's boasting. And so as you, as you look at that in context, and if Paul is going to boast to the Corinthians, even though he says, I know a guy— He's really probably talking about himself here. Almost certainly, as you look at this in context, it's Paul himself that he's talking about. And uh, uh, he, he, so he's, he's giving these, these, uh, re this report, basically, to the Corinthians of these visions and revelations that he's had. And we'll talk about that in just a second, but just sort of a short aside here before, uh, before we get too far into that. When we read these verses what almost always comes up is questions about all the, the, the books that you can buy about people who, who talk about stuff like this, visions and dreams and, and being taken up into heaven and that kind of stuff. And so just a quick word with how to deal with that. Uh, you you got to take them with a grain of salt. Sometimes you got to take them with a whole shaker of salt. Uh, the, the, and which is not to denigrate anybody's experience, not to say that anything did or didn't happen or anything like that. All, all it is to say is that God's final revelation of who he is and how he works comes to us in the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. And then the, the apostles who bear witness to that and whose words are written down in Scripture. And anything that directs our attention away from that, uh, away from God revealing himself in Scripture, anything that tells us about what God says— apart from Scripture, is to be approached really in two ways. First of all, with skepticism. And second of all, it should absolutely not define for us what we believe about God or about salvation or about the world. God gives us his Scriptures to do that. And so when you, when you, when you find these books and find these websites and find people talking about this kind of thing, that's how we approach it. We go back to Scripture for our ideas about God. 
Uh, and a couple other things to notice also about how Scripture talks about this. I mean, notice Paul is talking about something that happened to him 14 years ago. I mean, if you're boasting to the Corinthians, and we'll talk about why he does that in just a second, but if you're boasting to the Corinthians, if you're trying to kind of give yourself credibility, why talk about something that happened over a decade ago? Unless it didn't really happen very much in the interim. The other thing to notice about how Paul talks about it is, is he's not even sure what's going on. He says a couple of times, this happened in the body, out of the body, I really don't know. God knows. And in fact, elsewhere, he says, where there are prophecies, they will cease. So all that is to say, as you deal with these things, as you run across these things, the way that we deal with them is we go back to Scripture for what, uh, what we believe about God and the world and salvation and sin and all that kind of stuff, not to these visions and revelations and stuff like that. We take them with a grain of salt, we go back to Scripture. But they're interesting. They're exciting. And Paul knows that. In fact, that's why he lists these things here. That's why he calls it boasting at the beginning uh, uh, of this whole thing. It's exciting stuff. It's the big stuff. It's the stuff that if, uh, <laughs> if Paul had a social media account, this is the kind of stuff that he'd splash all over it, right? It'd be all about revelations, all about visions, all about God speaking to him personally, all about how special he is, how important, how amazing his life is all the time. That's the sort of stuff that he put up. That's the sort of stuff that he starts with. And that's the sort of stuff that social media in our lives tends to start and end with. I don't think it's any secret to any of us at this point that it paints an unrealistic picture of life. It has the effect of showing us all the best and the brightest things uh, in everybody else's life. All the most boastworthy moments, you might say. The kind of stuff that Paul's talking about at the beginning of our reading. The effect that that has on us is it sort of perpetuates the lie that we tell ourselves that everybody else's life is fine, it's good. Everybody else's family is perfect. Everybody else is constantly having fun. Everybody else has it held all together. I mean, really, social media in general is the Instagram beauty filter for all of our lives. You know, it's the thing that sort of makes it look good. But the reality behind it is that there's always suffering behind those good profile pictures that you see. There's always suffering behind the smiles that we put on our face. Every family has a story. We've all got circumstances. We've all got insecurities. We've all got issues. In short, everybody's got their stuff. And that's the thing we don't see on, so, you know, on social media pictures. And the reality is, Paul doesn't leave it with the big stuff at the beginning. The reality is Paul knows that those revelations from 14 years ago, they're going to be important in building trust with the church in Corinth. But he also knows that that's not the full reality of his life. And so he doesn't leave it there. And I think that's why he distances himself from his former self. I think that's why he talks about that guy uh, 14 years ago in the third person to create a little bit of distance between himself and his former self. Because he knows that the reality, the reality is that he's got a thorn in his flesh. The reality is that there's suffering behind all that stuff. So the other question that always comes up with this reading is, what's Paul's thorn in the flesh? And I'm going to answer it for you right now, okay? Everybody ready? You want to hear the answer? Uh, that's the answer. <laughs> I mean, really, that's the answer. We don't know what the thorn in the flesh is. People for years have speculated about this. There's all kinds of different ideas and theories. Here's some of the most popular ones. I put a list together for you. Uh, so people have said that it is temptation, that it's chronic eye problems that Paul kind of talks about elsewhere, malaria, uh, migraines, epilepsy, speech disability. And this is an interesting one. We use this phrase today sometimes to talk about people right? Oh, that person's a real thorn in my flesh, that kind of thing, right? Some people think that that's how Paul's using it too. He, uh, there's this guy, Alexander the coppersmith, that Paul mentions in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, and he says, Alexander the coppersmith did him great harm. Who knows? Maybe that's who he's talking about here. The Corinthians might have known, but we don't. And I think it's better that way. I think the Holy Spirit knew what he was doing when he inspired this whole thing. Because think about that list. 
health problems, temptation to sin, even sometimes people in our lives. They're all the kind of things that you and I can suffer with in our lives all the time. They're, they're all the kind of things that might lie behind the suffering that lies behind the profile pictures that you saw on your phone this morning or the smiles that you saw on faces on your way into church today. As far as the thorn in the flesh goes, what it is is not important. What it is doesn't matter. But two things do matter. First of all, it matters that it's relatable. And it is. Any one of those things could be relatable to any one of us. We could all have those kind of thorns in our flesh. And if it is relatable, that means that how Paul responds to it also matters, also makes a difference. And in Paul's response, that's where we find our two lifelines for this morning. So first and foremost, the way Paul responds is he cries out to God. Remember? Three times. Pleads with God, he even says. And that's only possible because of Jesus. It's only possible because of the life and the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. It's only possible because of the relationship that Jesus made for us with his heavenly Father and our heavenly Father. And it gives us something that we wouldn't have otherwise. And this is what Paul is using. It gives us access Paul himself says this in Ephesians 2.18. Here's what he says. He, he says, through him, through Jesus, we both, Jews and Gentiles, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. We have access because Jesus makes us children of God, makes us able to call God Father. To call God King, yes, but also to call God Father, which means we have access that we would never have otherwise. And it actually goes a little bit even beyond access, I think. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a little more than that. Uh, that's illustrated in the, 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 a little bit in the uh, uh, story of Thomas More. Do you know who Thomas More was? He was an English guy back around the time of the Reformation, and he was a politician, a philosopher, a clergyman in England. And he knew Henry VIII, and so they, they, would, uh, they would correspond back and forth from time to time. Uh, write letters and that sort of stuff. Uh, in other words, Thomas More had access to Henry VIII. But things went south because Thomas More did some things that Henry VIII didn't like very much. He refused to acknowledge the spiritual validity of Henry VIII's marriage to Anne Boleyn, and he refused to attend her coronation as well. And as a result, he didn't have access anymore. He lost his access. In fact, he even lost his life as a result because he had access, but what he didn't have was permission. He didn't have permission to say some of the stuff that he said to Henry VIII. Access, yes. Permission, no. What you have in Jesus is permission. You have the blessing of access, but see, because Jesus has made you from outsiders and sinners to children, to people of God, you also have permission. Permission to, to begin your prayer with our Father who art in heaven, my Father, your Father who art in heaven. Permission to do that, but also permission to come and bring to God your groaning, your suffering, your sadness, and even your anger. And that goes against conventional wisdom. It goes against our, our personal piety. Very often we're told, don't question God. But if you go throughout the Bible, it happens all over the place. People bring their questions and their frustrations to God all the time. The book of Psalms, the most prevalent type of psalm in the whole Psalter, the whole book of Psalms are lament psalms. And you know what they're also called? Complaint psalms. When you're bringing a complaint before God for how things are going. There's the whole book of Job where Job spends 38 chapters railing against God, railing with, against how he's being dealt with. And when, when God shows up and actually answers Job, he talks to his friends and says, he talks to Job's friends and says, Job has spoken rightly about me. Then there's all of Israel crying out to God under Egyptian slavery in the Exodus. This is from chapter 2 of Exodus, verses 23 through 25. And here's what it says. This is 23 to start with. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. 
that's permission to talk to God in a way that would have been unheard of if you went to the, any of the other religions around them. And look what happens as a result. God, this is verse 24, God heard their groaning. That's access, permission. God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's grace. And then listen, verse 25, God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. You have a God who, when you cry out to him, he knows exactly what you're going through. And think for a minute with me about how validating that is. That what you're suffering with, God acknowledges, actually is suffering. God's response to the people of Israel isn't, hey, it's not that bad, guys. At least you got a roof over your head. God's response to Paul isn't, you know, Paul, you're kind of whiny. You really need to you know, knock that off. He doesn't say those things at all. The thorn actually hurts. Egyptian slavery is actually a bad thing. And you're not only allowed, but you're encouraged, biblically, to cry out to God about it. To be sad and pray sad when you are sad. To be angry and pray angry when you are angry. Because you have a God who can take it. Because you have a God who understands not just generic grief and generic sorrow, but Isaiah 53 says you have a God who carried your grief and your sorrow and your suffering, and your sin, and all of your stuff. You know, all the stuff that doesn't make it to your social media feed. He took those things to the cross with him. He died for them so that you have permission to cry out to God about them. That's lifeline number one. It's permission to bring these things to the Father. But did you notice with Paul, God doesn't fix it. It's not that he never will. He will someday. There's no thorns in the new creation. So he will fix that someday. That's the promise of the cross, but not yet. And that's kind of the problem with Paul. Instead, God offers Paul what I think is an even greater gift, our second lifeline for today. The first is permission. The second is presence. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And I always thought that was a really kind of a cool verse, but a weirdly worded verse. My power is made perfect in, in weakness. But the word there also has the sense of reaches its fulfillment, reaches its goal, accomplishes its purpose, or something like that. We realize and we understand the power of God best and most fully when we are weak and when we're broken and when we're suffering. It's not different. The power of God doesn't change. It's always there. It's always the same. But we recognize it more. We see the grace of God and the power of the grace and the presence of God when we're faced with our own weakness. Because, see, the power of God is really all about presence, especially in weakness. All over the place in the Bible, when you have people who are dealing with kind of the non-Instagrammable moments of their lives, God's message is, fear not, for I am with you. Don't be afraid because I'm there too. And that's the gift that's given to you through the cross. A God who stays with you at all times, who may not answer prayers in the way that you'd like or the way that you want, but who walks with you through your stuff. A God whose presence means even in brokenness. And in, in whether you're wrestling with sin or whether you're wrestling with circumstance, you have nothing to fear. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. The presence of God means that we can say with Paul, when I am weak, then I am strong. Because God's grace is sufficient. One more thing before we wrap up. And that's this. Uh, these lifelines can really mean something for you, even if you're not suffering. I mean, I, I can imagine somebody sitting through this sermon series, and this sermon in particular, and kind of going, well, life is pretty good right now. It's actually all going very well, so this is nice, and it'll be good maybe sometime in the future. But in fact, if that's where you are, it just means that these lifelines should hit you a little bit differently. And here's what I mean. We have a God who always works through means. For example, he gives his word to human writers— who then write it down in Scripture. He doesn't just sort of hand it down from on high, except for the, the Ten Commandments, for example. He uses bread and wine 
to give us his very body and blood and grant us forgiveness, life, and salvation. And in fact, he takes on flesh in the incarnation to bring about that salvation. We have a God who works through means, a God who works incarnationally. And God's permission and God's presence, those lifelines, they work incarnationally too. To put it another way, we always need those lifelines, but sometimes you also get to be the lifeline for other people. And it works kind of like this. Uh, a while back, I was going through kind of a difficult time in my life, and I called a friend of mine up, and, and I called him, and he answered. He was in his car at the time, and he answered on the Bluetooth in his car, and it was him and his wife who were in the car. And, and I, just sort of, uh, I just sort of emotionally went, bleh. Have you had one of those times when you just kind of, everything just comes out, bleh? Uh, so it was about 15 minutes of me doing the emotional bleh to, uh, to my friend and his wife. And when I got done, they weren't quite sure what to do or what to say. Uh, but his wife said this, and I'll never forget it. She said, I'm not sure we can do anything really to help. But I just want you to know that we're happy to sit here with you in this in whatever way that we can. And I also want you to know that you can call anytime you want. And that's presence and it's permission from God, through the people of God. That's incarnational God working. And Paul gets at this too. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. Here's what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. The ministry of comfort, if, if you are not in a place of suffering right now, God be praised. But you're called and you're invited to do something really important. You're called and invited to be Christ to the people who are. You're called and invited to enter into their mess with them and sit there with them. You usually can't do anything about it. So you just sit, and you just listen, and you just invite them to talk. And maybe when the time is right, you point them back to the one who can do something about it, and who did do something about it, and who will do something about it, but who in the meantime, through Jesus, gives us his lifelines of presence and permission. To him be all glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds, keeping them steadfast in Christ Jesus. Amen.